Um, how is your guys' view of the bumper video? Absolutely Pretty great. good. Okay, cool. Um, hey, if you have your Bibles with you, which I hope you do, uh, we are we got two weeks left in our series called Simplify. Um, if you're new with us this morning, I'm stoked you're here. If you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we've been on a journey looking at the book of Romans, really asking the question, what do we believe? Why do we believe it? And why does it really matter? Right? I grew up going to church. Uh, and if I'm being totally honest, uh, a lot of church for me was just kind of... Um, behavior modification, right? Uh, what I mean by that is I just thought I had to act differently. And so it was like coming to church, I was like, oh, because I'm a Christian or this Jesus follower, that, that, that has to change the way that I act. It changes, you know, whether I party or don't party. It changes what I smoke or what I don't smoke. It changes my, you know, what I have to do with my sexuality before marriage. And it, like, it was a lot of behavior that I was, I was really, concerned with. And so in this series, what we've tried to do, um, Scott and I, over the last couple of weeks is break down, kind of go back to the foundation, right? If you're, if you were building a house or if you're building a sand castle, or if, um, did any of you ever do the like elementary school, like egg and popsicle stick project where you had to like suspend an egg and a bunch of popsicle sticks and then like chuck it off of a certain height. And like, if your egg didn't break, then you went up higher. And then if your egg didn't break, you went up higher. Did anybody do that? You do that here? No. I remember we, we did that when I was in elementary school and people came up with like the most fascinating designs. And then like sometimes the people that spent the most on it, they dropped it from like five feet and the egg was like, and it's like, oh, well, good job. And then I felt like the, the kid that was like, just slat, a, like just put a bunch of glue and popsicle sticks all the way around. Like somehow his egg survived from like a hundred feet. And you're like, that kid can't even zip up his own pants. Like how did that happen? Right. And it's just like, it was this fun, like construction project that we got to do. And uh, if, you th if you think about like building something and it starts getting rickety, or if you've ever like built blocks with like a little sibling or a little, uh, like a nephew or niece, or maybe a little cousin, and you start getting up high, you know how like the higher you go, it starts getting like shaky. Right? The answer is not to like fix the bricks up top. The answer is to go to the foundation, right? Does that make sense? Right? Like if, if your house was starting to lean or fall over, you wouldn't be like, well, let's change the roof. No, you'd be like, let's, let's get down to the basics here. Like what's, what's happening in the foundation? What's happening at the core of this thing? And so really our hope and desire over the last couple of weeks is to, to really look at the foundation of our faith. Why do we believe in Jesus? Who is this Jesus guy? What did he accomplish? Why does it matter? And really like at the end of the day, asking the question, like, so what? Right? Any, anybody play football in here? Anybody play football? Okay, any football fans? like watch football? Anybody ever been to a like football game, high school football game, freshman, whatever? Okay, I want you to imagine just for a second, okay, that uh, we were all at a football game together and you watch the team like go out on offense and you know, the coach calls in the play, quarterback's talking to the coach and then the coach runs out to the team and everybody like huddles up and you got like the huddle and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is a good play. This is a good play. And everybody huddles and they're like, oh, I like this play. Like this play is, this play is going to work. It's going to be effective. Like this is a good one. Everybody huddles and they're like, ready, break. And then they just run back to the bench and sit down. You'd be like, um, wait, <laughs> what? And then like, right, like second down, they, they're all, they'll run out. Coach talks to the quarterback. Quarterback's like, oh, that's, that's a good one, coach. That's a good one. And he runs back out and he's like, hey, guys, 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 let's get together. And everybody huddles up and everybody's like, everybody's in agreement. So they're like, oh, that's a good play. That's a good play. This one's going to be, this one's going to be good. Ooh, I like this play. Let's go, baby. And they're like, huddle up. And they're like, ready, break. And the whole team's like, Whew. tosses back, runs back and just sits on the bench. You'd be like, I don't think they get it. You're supposed to run the play. Right? Like that would be a ridiculous football game. Like how many times could they do that before us sitting in the stands would be like, well, finish my nachos. I'm out. Right? Like I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and watch this. And yet friends, I, I think so often this is, it's kind of what we do at church, right? We get together right? and, and we huddle up and we sing a worship song and we'll hear a message. You know, Scott will teach a message or I'll teach a message and, and we'll, we'll all gather up and we'll be like, hey, this is how we're supposed to live life. This is the, the play that's come down from coach, right? Like God has invited us into living life differently. This is what it's supposed to look like on a Monday, on a Tuesday, on a Thursday, not just on a Wednesday night and on a Sunday. And on, maybe on a Sunday or on a Wednesday, you're like, dang, like that's, 
that's convicting or that's good or that's, I need to lean into that. Maybe you have a cool conversation in your life group and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you all make this decision and you're like, ready? Let's go out and do this in life. Break. And then what? We run back to the bench and we sit and we wait for the next Sunday. We wait for the next life group conversation. We wait for the next time that Scott teaches a message or that I teach a message. And we just, we just kind of sit on the bench until Wednesdays and Sundays. And the invitation of this series It is to really ask the question, if Romans chapter one says that there is a God and that we have suppressed the truth, right? That that sin is not something that has been placed on us. It's something that we've chosen. We are, we chose autonomy. In the very beginning, page three of your Bible, it tells the story of Adam and Eve that they choose to do life that their their own way. And we, thousands of years later, we're still guilty of the same thing, right? Not, like not a single one of us would be like, I am without sin. It, it's pretty easy to see. Just look in the mirror. It, it, we're, we're all very aware of the own sin and our own, our own brokenness. You can see it in little kids really easily. We just get better at hiding it. We get better at masking it. We get better at comparing ourselves with the people around us to not really feel all that bad about ourselves. But then, right, Romans chapter three says that there's no one good, not even one. It says that all have sinned, that all fall short of the glory of God. If his standard is perfection, there's not a lot of us that meet that standard. And then Romans chapter six, it starts giving us the wages of that, right? It's what we have earned because of the sin present in our life is death. And whenever the book of Romans talks about life or death, what's it talking about? Temporal things or eternal things? Eternal, right? It's not just talking about like death, like right? It's not just talking about like physical death. Like I'm here and then I'm not here or like life. Like I have a pulse. I'm alive. No, it's whenever Romans references life, it's talking about this, this cosmos life, this life that, it, that exists into eternity, that the God of the Bible is a God that always has been and a God that always will be. So when it's talking about life and death, this is talking about eternity with God or eternity apart from God. So the wages of sin is eternity apart from God but there's a little but in there, right? There's a bunch of big buts in the Bible that are really, really important buts, okay? It says this, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the time of the year where we get really excited about gifts, right? I don't care how old you are, right? Like you can start kind of going, eh, whatever. Like I'm not as excited about Christmas, and maybe you're not at the point anymore where like you wake up at 4.30 in the morning and like sprint down the stairs. Any of you have little siblings? Little siblings? Are your little siblings still like amped about Christmas? They still like sprint downstairs and it's like bright and early. Anybody in here still amped about Christmas? Okay, okay, all right, all right. Me too. I, I'm 29 and I still love Christmas. Like I still, I wake up Christmas morning and I'm like, oh, right? And, and like presents aren't really a thing anymore. Like the kids get presents, but I still get excited. Right? I just, there's something about the Christmas spirit. It's just fun, right? So it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When was the last time, friends? When was the last time that when you came to church, when you opened up your Bible, when we got to enter into worship through music, we understood that the relationship that we have with God is because of the gift of Jesus, and I think this time of year, we can kind of go like, no, cool, yeah, baby Jesus, like eight pounds, seven ounce, sweet baby Jesus, right? And we're like, thank you, Jesus, for Christmas. Like, yes, it's great. But if I'm being honest, there's a lot of my life where I, I take that gift for granted. I just kind of go like, no, yeah, for sure, Jesus, the cross, Christianity, church, ah, I gotta do better. And then I don't do better, and I'm like, ah, frick, screwed up again, I gotta do better. Can we get back to the simplification of there is a God and we've suppressed the truth. No one's perfect, not even one. And the wages of not being perfect is eternal separation from him. But the gift of God is eternal life with Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus. And then Romans chapter five, it says God demonstrates his love for us in this. He wants to show us how much he loves us. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, when we were his enemy, at the perfect time, he demonstrates that while we're sinners, Jesus dies on the cross for us to pay the penalty that we couldn't pay so that we could live the life that he deserved. 
He died the death that I deserved so that I might live the life. And remember, that's not just like life, life. That's, that's life and life abundant. That's life and life to the fullest. That's, that's actual satisfaction. It's actual freedom. It's actual peace when what the world offers is anxiety and depression and stress. It's actual joy when what the world offers is fleeting happiness. It's actual fulfillment when what the world offers is little bits of satiation that leave me wanting more and more and more and more and more and more and more. It's why Tom Brady can't win enough Super Bowls. It's why Jeff Bezos can't make enough money. It's why celebrities can't get enough like uh, of just fun, exciting relationships that then end and then they jump into another fun, exciting and relationship. And we have whole magazines that track it. And we got like People Magazine and Us Weekly and The Bachelor. And we just go like, ooh, who's in relationship with who? And it's like, what, what is happening? And why is this so entertaining? And it's like, as long as we can keep ourselves like distracted and happy, we don't have to look at the foundation. We don't have to look at what's actually happening in our lives. And then this last week, Scott walked us through. Right? Romans chapter 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Right, that word Lord is kurios in the Greek. It means to hand over the steering wheel of life. Right, how many of you are starting to drive? Like permits, you know, you're like hopping behind the wheel of your parents' car, or thinking about starting to get your permit. And in today's day and age, it's like, I'm not getting my driver's license. I'll just get an e-bike, right? It's like for complete freedom for all times. Like, why would I need a car? Um, which is a great question. But Jesus is Lord, is handing over the steering wheel. It's going like, you're in charge anymore. Right? Old school driver's ed, I don't know if this is a thing anymore, but there used to be like two steering wheels. Is that still a thing? Anybody do driver's ed in here? There was like two steering wheels, two sets of gas and brakes on like both sides, which is sketched kind of when you think about it. But there was like a, a like switch in the car that you could switch it over to like the other side, which means like if driver's ed homie sitting in the right seat was like, this girl can't drive or this guy can't drive. He would just like switch it over and he would be in control, right? That's kind of what Romans 10 is demonstrating. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, not that you believe in him, right? Romans 10, notice Romans 10 doesn't say, if you believe in God, you will be saved. You know what the problem with that is? I can believe a lot of things that don't impact or change my life at all, Right? I can believe something to be true, right? I believe running is good for me. I believe that being in shape and going on runs would be like good for me and my health. doesn't mean I'm going to run. It doesn't mean I'm going to wake up early on like this morning when it's 40 degrees and exercise. Right? I love it the way Chris Brown said it in his sermon last week in big church. He said, I'm allergic to exercise. Like my face gets all red and I start sweating. He's like, I think I have an allergic reaction to it. And we can believe something to be good for us. I can believe that Taco Bell is bad for me. It's not going to stop me from eating a beefy five layer, right? It's just not like I, so, so we believe things all the time that don't actually impact our lives. So Romans 10 doesn't say believe in God and you'll go to heaven. But isn't that kind of what you were told growing up? Just believe in God and accept him into your heart. And then Jesus is going to just live in your heart and you'll be saved. And you're like, great. I'll just invite Jesus into my heart. I was sitting at a, a gospel presentation. You ever sat in one of those before? At a camp or something like that where somebody stands up and they preach the gospel and then they're like, does anybody want to be saved? Come forward. I was sitting at one of those and, and the, the guy up front said, there's a party going on in heaven. Who wants to be a part of that party? Who wants to believe in God and be a part of the party going in heaven? Everybody's like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> like if the options are heaven or, or like the party in heaven or like burning hell forever, I guess I'll choose the party. And it's like, great. One, two, three, oh, 37 people saved tonight. And it's like that, it doesn't really work that way. You, you can't just believe in God and then keep your hands on the steering wheel. And on a Monday and on a Tuesday, just do what you want to do and live the way that you want to live. And just you keep doing you. And that with your parents and with your sexuality and with your money and with, no, the call of the gospel is this. Jesus said this, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, which friends, that's, we're not really good at that, right? We're not good at denying ourself. In a society, in a culture that says, treat yourself, that says you deserve it. You've worked hard for it. 
right? You, you should have it. If it makes you feel good, do it. Right? The Bible's, the invitation for the gospel is the exact opposite. It says, deny yourself. Pick up your cross, which to them wasn't like a, it wasn't like a symbol of religion. It wasn't like that thing over the church or that cool dangly earring, right? For them, it was, it meant one thing and one thing only, and it was death. Deny yourself, die to yourself, and then follow Jesus. That's the call of the gospel. That's what it means to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. See, the, without the resurrection, there is no good news. Have you ever noticed how like the, the first like three or four steps of the, of the good news of the gospel are all like really, really bad news? You're like, okay, cool. Hit me with the good news. There's a God, you denied him. Um, there's no one good, not even one. There's no one who even desires God. And then the wages of the fact that you don't desire God is eternal separation from him in hell. Not because God put you there, but because you put you there by desiring to be autonomous. And you're like, wait, I thought you said good news. Mm-hmm. Let those three things sink in first. Then we get to the beauty of the gospel. Does that make sense? Right? We've, we've kind of harped on this all throughout this series, but without the bad news, there is no good news. If I can't understand the depth of my own sin and brokenness. Remember when Paige was up here on a Wednesday night and she said, you are far more sinful and broken than you could possibly imagine. Remember that? Right? You ever had somebody like make fun of you or say something bad about you or say something mean about you, right? That I love the quote that says something along the lines, I'm gonna butcher it, but it says something along the lines of like, it, we're very lucky that the people that are talking crap behind our backs don't actually know the depth of our brokenness and sin. Because what they're saying is like, it might not be entirely true, but I promise you, you're far worse and I'm far worse than anybody else has ever talked crap about us behind our backs. Does that make sense? Like somebody throws shade at me. They say something rude or mean. I'm like, good thing you don't actually know the depth of my brokenness because not only is that mean thing partially true, but it's, I'm much worse than you possibly think I am. We all are. But it's not just that we're, we're, we're so broken and that we're so uh, just like wretched in God's eyes. No, it's, we're far worse than we could possibly imagine, but we're also far more loved than we could possibly hope for. There's not a single one of us in this room that doesn't want to be known and still loved and accepted. All of us want that. All of us desire that. And the God of the universe says, I know you fully. I know the hairs on your head. You ever thought about that? You ever, like, has that ever blown your mind? I have an Australian shepherd. I pick up his hair all the freaking time, right? I just, if you have a dog who sheds, you're just constantly picking up hair. I, I vacuum like 18 times a day. It just is like the nature of owning a dog. But imagine, imagine stopping and going like, I'm gonna count bandit's hairs like on his body, one, two, like how high could you get before you lose track? And then you've covered like a quarter size of his, of his body, right? Like imagine trying to count the hairs on your own head. It's impossible. But the Bible says God, God knows that detail about you. Don't you think you know, he knows what you struggle with? Don't you think he knows your deepest insecurities and your fears? And he still looks at you and says, I love you. Okay, uh, this has been kind of striking me recently as I've, we, Paige and I have been watching Christmas movies. Anybody else watch like binge watch Christmas movies this time of year? Um, so I started with Coco. Um, you're like, that's not a Christmas movie. You're right, but I just wanted to watch it when I was on Disney Plus. So um, we watched uh, Coco a couple days ago. And then um, have, you, have you watched the new cartoon Grinch? Not like the old cartoon Grinch, but the new one. It's flipping funny. If you haven't watched it yet, do yourself a favor. Um, it's got like Pharrell in it and like a couple characters from The Office and it's a brilliant cartoon. And Piper, I kind of get upset with Piper when she like wanders off to not watch it anymore because like homie wants to watch the movie. And so when she's like outside bored in 10 minutes, I'm like, come on. Like, I just want to sit here with Hot Cocoa and watch this movie. But it's, there's a funny theme when you start watching like cartoons in particular with like, Coco, um, that's the Dia de los Muertos one. Y'all seen that one with the guitar? That one's great too. But like Luca, that one was big this year, right? Where like the sea monsters in Italy, Cinque Terre, all that jazz. Like these movies all have something in common, right? The Grinch, 
Coco, Luca, you could probably name more movies. But there's there's kind of this uh, veil that's pull, been pulled over people's eyes of like to something that they don't know is there. And then when they find out the truth, it like changes everything about their life, right? Like think about Coco. Like when he uh, becomes like the, the dead boy or like the alive boy who's in the realm of the dead and his eyes are open to all the skeletons and he first crosses over that big orange bridge and he's like, what, this is real? And they're like, of course this is real. Like you didn't believe this? And he's like, no, I just thought, I thought this was like one of those things that adults tell kids that's like real, but it's not actually real, like vitamins, right? And, he, and they're like, mm, vitamins are definitely, anyways, whatever, it's neither here nor there. But then it, like once his eyes are open to it, his entire life changes. It was like something that he didn't see before that now has drastically changed everything in his life, right? Same thing with Luca. He thinks that humans are like these evil beasts that are going to kill him and that, and vice versa. The humans are terrified of the sea monsters. And once both of their eyes are opened up, there's this like new relationship and this new realm that exists between the, the, the two of them. Does that make sense? And then uh, the Grinch, right? The Grinch is like humbug. Like I hate Christmas. And then he's like talking to Cindy Lou Who and she's like, but at Christmas, everybody's so happy and loving and yada, yada, yada. And he steals everything and they're still singing. And he's like, oh my gosh, maybe happiness is possible. And then he's sitting at the end and they're eating the roast beast. And he's just like, this is incredible. It changes everything about his life because he finds out the truth. It, the, the beauty of scripture is Jesus says this. He says, I am truth. And once they know the truth, the truth will set them free. It's like one of the most famous things Jesus ever said. It's actually printed on, or not printed, but like carved into the marble at the um, CIA's headquarters. Right? You know, Central, Central Intelligence Agency, it says they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. That, that's like the foundation of our country. And the Bible says they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. Luca, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Right? Coco, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The Grinch, if you knew the truth about Christmas, the truth would set you free. But all of them have, they, they have this thing pulled over their eyes and they go throughout their life living in falsity, living with this false presupposition of what life is all about. So the entire goal of this series is going ninth and 10th grader, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Hey, but look, friends, can we not be the type of people that just huddle up and then we're like, ooh, 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 hey, hey, this is gonna be good truth. Hey, listen, good truth right here, ready? Ready? There's a God, we've suppressed that truth. The penalty of that truth is eternal separation from him. Uh, the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if you confess through your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Ready? Break. And then you go out on a Monday and go, cool. School, family, friends, hobbies. Oh man, I gotta, I gotta try and be better. And then Wednesday night life group, your life group leader's like, so how was your week? Did you listen to the sermon? Yeah, but I don't really remember anything about it. Yeah, but remember we huddled up and then, bro, right? Do you get it? Do you get what I'm getting at here? Like, I don't know, I don't, you, got, you guys are all smart people. I don't need to spell this out for you entirely, but I think we do this. I know I do this. I'll go to my life group. I'll listen to a sermon, a podcast and be like, ooh, that's good. Num, 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 num. That's nice. Ready? Break. And then I'll just go live my life, do my thing. Friends, Jesus doesn't want us to huddle twice a week. He wants to walk with you day in and day out. He wants to be in relationship with you. This can't just be a religion. This can't just be a moral behavior modification. It's gotta be a relationship. There's gotta be trust. What is your hope placed in? Okay, so Romans chapter 12. You're like, finally, Relax, okay? Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, okay? If you do something in view of something, what are you doing? In front of, what's a view? What does the word vista mean? Y'all know what your city means? It means view. Vista means view, in view of something, if you're looking, if you're uh, in view of the Grand Canyon, what can you see? 
the Grand Canyon, okay? This isn't like a trick question. You're like, um, uh, Arizona, Nevada? Uh, I don't know, right? Okay, if you're in view of North Coast Church, what can you see? If you're in view of Silas Lopez, what can you see? Silas Lopez, okay? So if you're in view of God's mercy, what do you need to be looking at? God's mercy, good, okay? Can anybody define mercy for me? Joel, what's mercy? Yeah. No, the other Joel. Is there another Joel? All right, Joel. (laughs) What's mercy? You don't know? Okay. What's mercy? No. I love the effort though. It's scary to step out in front of your peers and answer a question. And I appreciate that you both stepped out in front of your peers. What's mercy? Good. Okay. It's withholding what you actually deserve. Does that make sense? Okay. So what's grace? Good. Okay. Does that make sense? There's a distinction there. Mercy is the withholding of punishment that you deserve. Romans chapter six, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. So what have we earned because of the sin present in our life? Death, okay? And is that just a temporal death or an eternal death? Eternal, okay? And that's an eternal separation from God. So mercy is what? Good, okay? So what do we deserve? Death. So what is God withholding? Death. Good. That's mercy. So Jesus' death on the cross, it, it is this expression of mercy. I'm going to withhold the punishment that you deserve and I'm going to put it on Jesus. Now grace is what again? Nice and loud. Getting something that you do not deserve. Okay. So the wages of sin is death. What do we not deserve? Life. And life abundant, life and life eternal. The wages of sin is death, but, big but, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mercy, withholding punishment, grace, giving a gift on top of that. Hey, Charlie, you started to drive. Yeah, I saw you pull away in the Mini Cooper this last week. Hey, Charlie, if I just, I was like, hey, take my truck for a spin. And I just tossed you my keys. And you just, you went out and within the first 30 seconds, you just wrecked my truck. You like flipped it, rolled it. It's all dented in, it's totaled. Mercy would me be going, hey, you know what? You don't have to pay for it. What do you, what do you deserve and what do you owe me because you wrecked my truck? You gotta pay for it. That's the penalty for crashing my truck. It was your decision. It was your mistake. It was your consequence. Mercy is me going, you know what? Don't worry about it. I got you. I will, f- I will pay the bill. Grace is then me going, you know what? Here's another truck. You can have it. It's yours. That's a gift. You'd be like, wait, I just wrecked your truck. I'm like, I know. Mercy, grace. Does that make sense? Right? That's like super boiled down. But mercy is going, hey, you deserve death. You're not going to die. We're even. We're square. Grace is then going, I'm actually going to take a step beyond that and give you a gift. Okay? Now let's read this passage. Therefore, I urge you and brothers and sisters. This is believers, by the way. Hey, this is in light of Romans 10. So Romans chapter 12, if you're reading this and you're, as not a follower of Jesus, remember the book of Romans is written by who? Paul, good. And he's writing to who? The Romans, right? These aren't people that grew up with church. These aren't people that understood the entirety of the Old Testament. Hey, he's writing to a group of people and going, this is the basics of Christianity. But by the time he's gotten to Romans chapter 12, he's already covered Romans chapters one through 11, which means he's laid out the gospel. So when he says, I urge you brothers and sisters, he's talking to the church. He's talking to people that have surrendered their life to Jesus. So in Romans chapter 12, he's gonna go, so what? Romans chapter one through 11, bunch of information. Romans chapter 12, he starts starts pivoting, going, so what? Why does this matter? Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So what are they looking at? His mercy. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. What the frick does that mean? 
And what's a living sacrifice? It's like jumbo shrimp, plastic glasses, freezer burn. Maybe these are all oxymorons. Living sacrifice is an oxymoron. That doesn't make sense. What's something that's sacrificed is dead. Something that's living is alive. What's a living sacrifice? Hey, write this down as you're taking notes. The, the, the sacrificial system in the Old Testament did two things, okay? Number one, Silas Lopez, what did it do? Good. And number two? Good. Who said that? Good, Kyla. Okay. Our sin, the sacrificial system in your your whole Old Testament, okay? When you read your Old Testament, there's a nation called Israel. For thousand years or more, right, Israel They had this sacrificial system that was a part of God's plan to point to a greater sacrifice. It was like foreshadowing. You know what I mean by foreshadowing? You ever watch a movie and then you watch it again and you start picking up on little clues in the beginning that are pointing to something that's going to happen at the end of the movie, right? That's foreshadowing. A lot of the Old Testament is foreshadowing to something that was going to happen. So if you kill a baby lamb, it's pretty hard to not be around a dead animal without thinking about how gross it is. I don't know if you've ever been around a dead animal before, but it's gnarly, right? Just blood and guts and it's disgusting, okay? So Jesus or or God all throughout the Old Testament is going, I want it to remind you of how gross your sin is. Why why do you think God needs to remind us of how bad our sin is? Because we we forget. It's pretty easy to start living our life and going, I'm not that bad, right? It's really easy to start comparing yourself to the people around you and going like, I'm not that bad. I can, every single one of us can find somebody that's worse than us, right? You can find somebody that lies more than you do, that steals more than you do, that cheats more than you do, that treats people worse than you do. That's maybe having sex or doing drugs or whatever it is. And you go, I'm not that bad. Hey, the sacrificial system, it reminded us, I'm that bad. Remember Romans chapter three, verse 10? There's no one good, not even one. And then number two, it points to the cross. Hey, do you remember in our series, um, if if you were here, we did OGs of the OT, right? We did this bow tie thing. This is your old Testament. This is your new Testament. And then this is us here in 2021. Hey, so your sacrificial system existed here and it pointed to what? The cross, right? Your entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. The entire book, every verse, every page, every story, the entire thing's about Jesus. So here, Romans chapter 12 when he says, present yourself as a living sacrifice, what two things are we supposed to do now as, as followers of Jesus? Number one, living sacrifice. What does the sacrifice do? It's not a trick question. Good. And number two, points to the cross. So when he says living sacrifice, Present yourselves in view of God's mercy. Don't just remember how gross you are. You ever sinned before and felt like crap about it? Right? You ever like told your life group that you weren't gonna look at porn again and then you looked at porn again? You ever like like, told yourself you weren't gonna cheat on a test and then you forgot to study and then uh, you procrastinated and then you were like, ah, screw it. And you just cheated. You ever been like, I'm not gonna lie anymore and then you lied again? Right? This isn't saying, remember how gross your sin is and feel shameful about it. No, shame has no place in the presence of God. That's why Paul starts with, in view of God's mercy, you gotta know first and foremost who Jesus is and what he accomplished. But in view of God's mercy, remember that you need his mercy, right? How many of us walk around, I don't, I don't really need God. It's a, nice, like, it's a nice afterthought. It's a nice additive, but I don't need him. That's why he goes, living sacrifice, remember that you need him. Remember that you need mercy, but then remember that there was a cross, right? Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. These are opposite words. By the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You ever thought to yourself, I just wish I knew what God wanted to do with my life. Like if God just came down and was like, let me tell you what I want for all of your life. And he just sat down and he just went, Marco Dimicelli. Let me just 
me and you one-on-one. Let me just tell you what I want for your life. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if God was just like, hey, let me just give it to you straight. This is what I want for all of your life. It's verses like this that I go, oh, I, I actually think he does. I think I'm just too busy living not in view of his mercy and I'm conforming to the patterns of this world rather than being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Therefore, I don't know what God's will is. He goes, if you wanna know what my will is, don't conform to the patterns of this world. Rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hey, if you're taking notes, write this down. Conform equals passive. Okay, conform equals passive. And this is the last thing we're gonna talk about and then we're gonna be done. Transform equals active. Okay, here's what I mean by that. Um, if you get, uh, if we, if you and I just, we went home right now and I was like, you wanna do a craft? And you were like more than anything in the world, Austin. And we made some homemade Play-Doh. And then we put it in a Ziploc bag and we just like Ziplocked it. And it was just like uh, in a Ziploc bag. What does that Play-Doh become the shape of? Ziploc bag. Does the Play-Doh need to do anything to become the shape of the Ziploc bag? No, it just conforms. Does that make sense? It's conforming to the shape of the container that it is in. So for that Play-Doh to be transformed to be turned into something. You know those little like, you know, you know the Transformer movies? It, it like by very nature, the name, it says it was one thing and now it is another thing. It was a Camaro, now it is a uh, Bumblebee. Thank you. I almost said Optimus Prime and I would have been excommunicated from the Transformer community, okay? It was a Camaro, now it is Bumblebee. So to be transformed requires action. Does that make sense? So what Paul's saying here is, in view of God's mercy, remember that there was a punishment that we don't have anymore. Hey, okay? offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Remember how gross your sin is and remember that there was a sacrifice for that. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. Friends, what do you think it takes to conform to the patterns of this world? What are the patterns of this world? What's its culture, its society, it's the waters that you swim in, it's the high school you go to, it's the shows you watch, it's the music, it's just, it's what the world says is important, right? As you walk through your life and when you're in your high schools and you're in your friend groups outside of church, do you constantly have people telling you, hey, Jesus is the most important thing you could possibly need in your life and he loves you and he's there for you and he knows the hairs on your head and no, that's not, that's not what happens in your normal life. Right? Most of you go to schools and have teachers who Jesus is not the most important thing to them. Maybe you have a teacher who's a, a follower of Jesus, but most of you probably don't. So the patterns of this world are pretty obvious. Just look around. So it's saying don't conform to the patterns of the world. What do you, friends, what do you think you have to do to conform to the patterns of this world? Nothing. You don't have to do anything. Just live. Friends, this is why passivity is terrifying. Hey, this is why you're gonna hear me and Scott get so amped up up here. You ever notice that me and Scott, like especially when we teach about uh, this series, Simplify, that like we'll start out teaching and like at certain points in the sermon, we're like, listen, right? We're all like amped up about it. It's because both of us have lived our lives at the point where we've just like, just been passive, apathetic, just letting things happen to us. If you were training for a marathon and you did nothing and the day the marathon came, how ready would you be for that marathon? Nothing. Because you did what? Nothing. It, he's saying, if you do nothing, you will conform to the patterns of this world. There's no such thing as standing still. It's impossible. You're either conforming to the patterns of this world or being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So friends, I can confidently say this as a ninth and 10th grader, please listen. If you aren't being transformed daily by Jesus, you are conforming to the patterns of this world. Does that make sense? If, if Jesus isn't an active pursuit of yours, then you are conforming to the patterns of this world. It's impossible to stand still. 
It'd be like if I asked you, if I sat down afterwards and I went, hey, I just, I really want to be friends, like good friends, like me and you. Can we be best friends? And you were like, uh, I don't know. Okay, fine. If we weren't becoming friends, we aren't going to be friends. Does that make sense? It's like that simple. It's like if we're not taking steps towards friendship, if I was just like, hey, let's be best friends. And you were like, oh, okay. And then I just never called you, never texted you. We never hung out. We never talked. And then next time I saw you, I was like, let's be best friends. You'd be like, wait, I've been down this road before with you. You didn't call. You didn't text. There was no mutual trust. We didn't share anything with each other. And I went, no, no, no. I really want to be best friends. Does that make sense? Like, this is what we do though. Sometimes we go, well, I don't want to conform to the patterns of this world. I want to know the God's will for my life. I don't want to become, I don't want to make sex what the world says it is. I don't want to make money what the world says it is. You want to know why? Because there's never going to be enough money. I don't care if you make $80,000 or if you make $80 million, it's not going to be enough. There's not going to be enough sex. There's not going to be enough money. There's not going to be enough success, right? Whether you're a professional skater or a professional snowboarder or a professional clothing designer or you're the next Jeff Bezos, it's, it's not it will not satiate. You're going to be happy for a while if you can keep yourself distracted. But friends, if you're not being transformed by Jesus, you are conforming. So if you come here twice a week on Sundays and Wednesdays and go, I want to be transformed by Jesus, and then you go back and sit on the bench, you will conform to the patterns of this world. Does that make sense? And, and, and this, isn't, this isn't me going like, don't conform to the patterns of this world. No, this is like, like Coco and the Grinch, and uh, Luca, like, I want to be somebody that goes, friends, would you please know the truth? Because the truth is going to set you free. And I want you to be free. I want you to experience life and life abundant through the person of Jesus. Because the opposite leads to just depression and anxiety and shame and brokenness and bondage and broken relationships and broken marriages and broken fatherhoods and motherhoods. And it just... If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Will it be easy? Heck no, techno. Is it worth it? Absolutely. And let me pray for us. God, thanks for today. Thanks for the opportunity to just sit and talk about your truth, God. And I just ask boldly that this morning, God, that your truth, that we would know it, that we would be transformed by it, that as we encounter you, God, that we wouldn't walk away from here and just sit on the bench. God, would we ask the question, so what? And then would we boldly live transformed by your truth? Would we pursue relationship with you above all else? We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.